quo, si qua wanna 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 wanna, si qua qui, si qua quo. Oh, nicotina, si qua qui, si qua quo. Oh, nicotina, si qua qui, qua quo. Si qua wanna 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 wanna, si qua qui, si qua quo. Si qua wanna 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 wanna, si qua qui, si qua quo. Oh, nicotina, si qua qui, si qua quo. Located in Northeast Saskatchewan, Cumberland House is not only Saskatchewan's oldest Métis community, but one of Western Canada's oldest settlements. Established in 1774 by explorer Samuel Hearn, Cumberland House was originally established as an inland trading post for the Hudson Bay Company and served as both a major distribution depot and a transportation centre well into the 20th century. For over 200 years, the community of Cumberland House has maintained its strong Métis roots that reached back to the early days of the fur trade. By the time Hearn made his journey into northern Saskatchewan, marriages between First Nations women and European traders had become commonplace throughout the country. European traders were quickly realizing the advantages a native wife could provide. Acting as cultural liaisons, native women helped facilitate trade and cemented relationships between her family and European fur traders. To the marriage, Native women brought country skills which repeatedly ensured survival to the European fur trader inexperienced with the harsh environment. Native women manufactured moccasins, snowshoes and clothing, made nets, tanned hides and provisioned food. These skills, which proved invaluable to the Hudson Bay Company, were the same skills that Native women taught their Métis daughters. This generation of Métis daughters, like generations of Métis women that followed, continued to supply goods and provisions to the Hudson Bay Company, as well as manufacturing clothing for themselves and their families. In many communities, sewing and beading was an integral facet of the lives of Métis women, as it was seen as a way to keep their artistry and heritage alive. For generations, Métis women made a large amount of the clothing that was worn by their families and by members of the community. Métis women made clothing that was practical, durable and warm, Yet, they wanted their garments to be beautiful works of art decorated with intricate floral designs of beads, silk embroidery, or porcupine clothes. Only rarely would an individual wear an outfit that did not have at least one handmade article of clothing. As a result, Métis women often spent a significant amount of time sewing, mending, and decorating items of clothing. It is in this spirit that many Métis women today continue to practice traditional skills passed on to them by their mothers, aunts, and grandmothers. Women like Isabel Impey work to preserve the artistic traditions and heritage of the generations of Métis women that have gone before them. For Métis women, sewing and beadworking was often a social event where the women sewed cooperatively and did beadwork in small social groups. Isabel Impey, who was born and raised in Cumberland House, Saskatchewan, recalls one of the highlights of her time spent in Cumberland House is the time she spent sewing with the other women in the community. I think there was influence as soon as I was old enough to handle a needle because uh, the women were always beating. It was like what was beautiful about it, it was always a social event. You'd all get together and 
there would be a big pot of tea and uh, the women would sit around and they would beat and tease each other or tell stories and uh, it was wonderful and uh, it was a nice way of coming together with uh, other women in the community and there were some real awesome beaters in that community. Isabel was taught to bead by her mother Cecilia Dorian, her aunts Anne, Helen and Mariah Dorian as well as by other women in the community such as Agnes Ducian and Margaret Macaulay. I was very fortunate I had more than one mother because we had the extended family system. My mother was uh, a very strong individual and uh, very determined and she had uh, a lot of ha aspirations for us as uh, when we were young people. Things that we would do with our lives and sort of coached us along in terms of where that would lead. Well in our family the aunts were very much part of uh, the upbringing and so I was very fortunate I had Mariah as well and Anne and Helen and so I was never without a mother they all became my mums as I was growing up. Isabel recalls that for young women, their first piece of beadwork was often significant. The first piece that I made, I think when I think back, I, probably something somebody hid after I finished it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't uh, very, very well done, but one of the, uh, the things that uh, really stand out in my mind is that when people learn to be, nobody ever pulled it apart, eh? They just left it the way that you did it. They would try and teach you the right way, and uh, as you learned to do more, then it became more refined. But nobody sat there and ripped out your beating. And uh, you learned by you know, doing more and more beating, and then uh, you got better at it. But your first piece was always important as well. And Mrs. McCauley, uh, who loved to beat, and I, I think there was a, a bit of an influence on the Dene side as well, with, uh, with some of the work that she did. Um, she loved to bead, and uh, one of the things that she said uh, is that she, she did it right from early childhood, there was, because there was such a belief that idle hands get into trouble. So the girls learned early how to keep their, their hands busy. Isabel's sister, Elsie, remembers the many lessons she learned during her time spent beating with the women of Cumberland House. Beating was a time for women to come together to visit, laugh, and sing, as well as a time to pass on knowledge and skills to the younger women. Oh, I remember it pretty young, and uh, I would say um, probably about five years old. I remember, uh, I'm not sure if I was involved or in which way I was involved, but I remember a lot of women sitting around, you know, just doing beadwork and visiting and laughing and telling funny, funny stories. And I'm trying to comprehend, you know, what, the humor in these stories. That That's what I remember. I had poor, very poor eyesight. And in those days, um, uh, we had to do beadwork or embroidery by coal oil lamp. And so, uh, I didn't have glasses at the time. Uh, in a nice way, I was being let off the hook, <laughs> you know, from learning <laughs> about beadwork as much as, as everyone else did. But I was always there with everybody. One of the things that I learned, and that when I think about it now, is that there was always this work. Everyone was 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 laughing. That's what I remember most. I know it's probably more than that. And then that we were always preparing for the next season that was coming. And yet we were kind of putting away the other season that we just left. And it was just, we were always going around and around and around. And the same with my grandmother Isabel, and I think I mentioned her grandmother Isabel Dorian. But on top of, of doing this stuff, she is also fixing everybody up because she had the medicines. Yeah. So that's in our family as well, a healer, healer lady. One of the other things that happened um, when you were, you, you would get your lessons, and I guess the uh, the women picked the the best time when you were relaxing, you were beating, you were visiting, so they would maybe uh, give you a lesson. Um, 
about being a woman, for example. And the women would start talking about, you know, being female and what that meant, and uh, some of the things, uh, the lessons that came with that. We used to sing uh, our old country and western orals, uh, things we learned in church, you know. We, we could sing in French, we could sing in Cree, we could sing in English and Latin. Yeah. <laughs> I remember um, when we first started singing, was it, it had just come out, it was a, a new song, and we're really dating ourselves there. When we used to harmonize at Carmel by the Sea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. And you were encouraged to sing, uh, everyone sang. Sometimes I think uh, they would rather that um, some of us didn't sing, but <laughs> most of us were encouraged to just keep singing, and uh, it was part of our life. My mother couldn't <laughs> sing. <laughs> she tried, but uh, she couldn't dance either, as I recall. But uh, I'm not sure where, but it was, it was really... Uh, uh, um, we were given every opportunity to play music yeah. and to sing, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure where that came from. was growing up, Cumberland House was a very close-knit community of about 1,000 people. Visiting and dancing were the highlight of many in the community and were a common occurrence, sometimes taking place twice a week on Wednesday and Saturday evenings. Many people continued to live off the land, hunting, trapping, and fishing as wildlife resources were plentiful. It is this lifestyle that influenced Isabel as an artist. I think the whole community shapes a person and certainly Cumberland uh, uh, shaped me in terms of uh, where I was going to go with my life. So some of the things that we made in the community would be garments for people to wear, particularly things that you want people to be warm uh, in the winter. We uh, did a lot of the leather work uh, for jackets and, uh, and shoes to keep your feet warm. So we ended up making a lot of moccasins and uh, the wraparounds were, were very common because we had a lot of snow and so you would have these wraparounds so you could tie them around your leg and they would keep the snow out and your feet would stay dry. Um, the other things that we made would be blankets. We made uh, a lot of quilts and different kinds of blankets to keep uh, the family members warm during the winter and the cold, cold months. And there were some real awesome beaters in that community some of the work that they did. You know, you'd see the work in, even on the animals, like you'd, if you could see a dog blanket, beaded dog blanket that, so they, they weren't just uh, beating for family members, but they were actually beating for, you know, to, to decorate another part of their life, which would be their dog team, because I was the, the uh, common transportation in the wintertime. Isabel formed a very special relationship with one of the women, Mrs. Margaret McCauley, who became an important influence in Isabel's life. If anyone wanted to, she would be there for them. She was always very generous with her time. And uh, she loved to visit and had a lot of stories to tell. And she made it a joy to spend time with her. As, while she was teaching you, she was actually uh, doing other wonderful things. So she's certainly one that, uh, you know, has gone now. and. Uh, She's been a strong influence in my family and uh, to me particularly with, uh, with the beadwork. Cumberland House, like in many Métis communities, had independent leadership skills and contributed to the household economy by hunting and trapping and by processing and tanning hides. 
In the 1940s, Isabel's mother, Cecilia Dorian, petitioned the province of Saskatchewan for trappers' rights when the province interfered with their seasonal activity. She had her own traditional trap line. I think it went back for generations a certain territory that we had as a trap line. Then, you know, as more trappers came in, it kind of, kind of got divvied up. And mom had her own. And uh, so Doris and I used to go out with her. <laughs> and one time, one time we were, uh, uh, we had to go with her by canoe, paddling, not paddling, using a pasos, a pasui. Um, a long pole, you know, just to, to pull the, the canoe around from trap to trap and uh, from house to house. And uh, I got that that apostle stuck in a mud, and she hit, she told me, let it go, let it go, and I, I she, she yelled too late. <laughs> we were in the water. <laughs> so we had to find a little island and dry our clothes and, uh, and a lot of other women in Cumberland were trappers particularly uh, within walking distance mainly um, muskrats yes oh yes so it provided us with the food and uh, provided us with money for the selling the pelts and then for using it for you know for uh, clothing whatever it was a very strong part of the economy of the island, as I recall in my younger days. Women had uh, their own very special skills that uh, uh, they didn't compete in. I remember uh, being asked by the women to go and help taking the hair, removing the hair off the, uh, the hide. And uh, Grandma Isabel, uh, mm -hmm. she'd call us and we'd go over and uh, we knew it was time to take the hair off, and uh, they made this uh, this tool that you would use. Mataygana. Mataygana, yeah. Mataygana. And you had to really work hard to get the hair off because it was really quite blunt, and uh, it took quite a while to do it, but, sh but it was made that way so it wouldn't go through the hide, so it would uh, leave the the piece that you're going to use eventually. For it. I've never learned the other parts. I've seen her do it, but uh, she finished the, uh, the, uh, the hide herself. But I remember her always saying uh, to the hunters, bring the brains. Uh, and because now they use lard and different things to soften the, the hide, but she always said that it's only the brain that will do a good job on that. That you're using different parts of the animal to uh, to have the finished product. Sometimes there was a whole pile of hides that were going. Yeah, there was a, it was a community, or maybe just our little section of Cumberland. You know, where everybody would get together and and uh, get to work on the hides. <laughs> As Isabel was growing up, she remembers beadwork designs and moccasin styles that were distinctly from Cumberland House. The style of the beadwork in Cumberland was mainly floral. Uh, rarely would you see animals. And I think the beadwork in Cumberland, and there's still that strong influence today, is to show. Uh, beadwork is uh, tedious if you're, if you're not used to doing it. And if you don't do it for the joy, but you want to make something special for someone, it's your way of saying you're special and I did all this for you. And, uh, and generally it would be the, uh, the floral pattern. Later in years you see now with the, the other, like you'll see the, uh, the roses, for example, I've seen the rose style now coming up out from Cumberland. And uh, I don't see this style at all in Cumberland now. 
They've lost some of their old styles that they had as well. I think it's totally missing from the beadwork, which is unfortunate because that is so beautiful when you can uh, combine uh, all those different designs in, in that. The, uh, the most common style are these floral designs that you see here. These are the most common ones in, uh, in Cumberland. Uh, everything had beautiful flowers and there were bright colors, uh, bright beads. and So we saw a lot of the floral designs in Cumberland. And uh, you see some of those floral designs as well on this little child's uh, cradle board. The, um, but we also had other designs and there was uh, an influence of the Dene in our community. Like the Mackenzies had uh, Dene background. And we also have Dene in our family. Our uh, great grandmother came from Lac Brochet. And uh, the Dene part of our family complements uh, Angie's coat because they tend to make more of the pointed uh, flower, not that round flower that the, uh, the people made in Cumberland, but more of the pointed ones. And I think it's, uh, it's wonderful to be able to adopt uh, the two uh, cultures. In Cumberland, they had uh, several styles. One was a pointed toe. It was, uh, I haven't seen that style. And the, the po this, this part was pointed. You had all the beadwork, but this was pointed like this. And also, you wouldn't have this down. It would be standing up. And those were the dress-up ones. And you always wore your mocks and rubber with those ones. You didn't get those ones dirty. <laughs> you saved them for good wear. And that was, I saw the, the men wearing that kind of style. Uh, these came a little later, and uh, when I was growing up, I had this style as well, with, with a rounded uh, foot. But the, the old style, and they were, I remember Miriam Carrier making those pointed ones and what yeah, intricate work she did on those. I think the, uh, the women uh, spent so much time uh, preparing moccasins for everybody else. They, they, I always noticed that there was a lot of beautiful beadwork on the men's moccasins. And uh, sometimes I used to think it was a shame that they would hide some of the beadwork because they had to wear rubbers over them, you know, or, or something else. But the women in the community always had beaded vamps. Not solid beading always, you know, sometimes it would be just a flower, but they always had beaded vamps. But they didn't wear the ones with the, uh, with the vamp, uh, beaded vamp standing up on the moccasin. Yeah, normally it would be just the, the regular. Passing on these traditions is very important to Isabel. To this end, she has taught her daughter and her granddaughters to bead. Isabel also played an influential role in the Gabriel Dumont Institute's Métis Beadwork Preservation Workshop. And today's a real good example of uh, you know, the women getting together and uh, the, the enjoyment and the, the stories and the you know, information people are sharing. And that uh, was always a way of learning, first of all. Uh, it's easier to teach someone when you have something that's finished and, and let them you know, create something similar. That's uh, a choice that they, they make and if it's something that they particularly care for. So uh, for young women, that was one of the influences. If you uh, really liked something, then someone would teach you how to do it. And uh, so in a way, you were given gifts and you know the gift to be able to, to make uh, slippers or to make a, a beaded piece for someone uh, that was important. Uh, but more important was the, um, the ability for women to be able to work together to make a big piece of uh, garment, for example, something that may be a, a buckskin jacket. And instead of one person doing it, it would be a long, drawn out process to get that uh, jacket done. But if you had enough women together, uh, who would come and visit and socialize, time really flies. It, and it seems like it didn't take a whole lot of time to make a jacket. It took the burden away from one person of having to do that, uh, even though generally if you're making something, it's because there's uh, a lot of other things that goes with that. 
And one of the stories that uh, I had heard that was uh, made a whole lot of sense to me in that uh, each of the beads represents a spirit. As you're working on a, a piece and you're working with all these beads, and for some people it's the spirit of giving. You know, it's, it, it's, it's the spirit of uh, enjoyment uh, in doing the, uh, the garment or whatever it is you're beading. And um, so when you're looking at a piece, you're not looking at it just as aesthetics, that it, it, it has the right colors or it looks right or it feels right. But it's more, I pick these colors and I put these beads together because I care for the person who's ultimately going to wear the uh, garment. And I think it was that, that spirit that was there when everyone got together and decided to uh, to have their beading sessions and prepare a garment. You know, everyone was so busy in the fall, especially in the fall, uh, uh, doing beadwork, preparing for Christmas. Uh, uh, like the, the beadwork used to be just awesome. Uh, the, in the fall, uh, everyone participated in, in preparing the hide and then they'd get down to the beadwork in the fall and by Christmas, you know, and we'd go into that old log church, you know, that was heated with this this uh, wood stove, and you could just smell <laughs> the 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 uh, moose hide, the tan moose hide, the smoke tan moose hide is it, the smell was so strong. Uh, but for me, it was a good smell, and to this day, I just love the smell of of moose hide, but I remember that being so strong in church with all these pretty, pretty uh, moccasins and even gloves, you know, gloves that were all embroidered and, or, or beadwork and embroidery, but the, what really stands out for me is the smell of the smoke, yeah, smoke hide. Virgin mother and child, holy so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. Isabel's daughter Louise, in an interview with Leah Dorian Paquin, remembers being taught to bead by her mother. When you first started picking up a needle, what were the first skills that your mom taught you? If you lose the needle, then you have to find it. <laughs> <laughs> so she was worried, you know, that somebody would step on the needle, of course, oh, if you draw, you know, yeah. if you lost that needle. Because, and, uh, and it was really frustrating at first trying to thread those things. And uh, she didn't, she didn't, like she was saying yesterday, she didn't specify any colors. She just let us do what we wanted to do with it. She, uh, and then just helped us along the way. What is she like as a teacher? Well, she's very patient, more patient probably than I am with my own. I think just letting us experience um, what we needed to, to experience um, showed her patience with us. Does she spend a lot of time with the grandkids? Yes, she does. She spends a lot of time with them. Um, you know, she works a lot, so there isn't a lot of extra time. But she does. She always phones Talisa up because Talisa loves Bannock, and she always makes sure that Talisa's included when she's making um, Bannock. And so she always includes the kids and everything. Your first patterns that you worked on, did you always work on floral? How long did it take you to... Floral is so challenging. Did you start out with that? Um, yes. I would have to say yes because uh, because Grandma had the patterns around the house all over and she was working on them so we would just pick up the patterns that she had around the house and uh, although I find myself doing more um, abstract. So you really have an, ar an artistic statement with your work? There's a real yeah. part of you who yeah. your creative process that you're going through. That's right. I'd rather yeah. be a designer. Yeah. Yes. Would you identify your mom as an artist? Yes. Has Isabel created a lot of her own patterns too, or a lot of them traditional patterns that she does? Um, pattern, we could find anywhere, you know, mm -hmm. she just, even a picture, a picture of anything, it might not even be a pattern, 
it, it, you know, as such. It's just a picture. Like the boys, it's kind of been a challenge to get the boys a jacket, the grandsons, because all the grandchildren have had a jacket. But it's it's rather challenging, I think, to, for the for mom to find masculine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So she ends up um, with pictures like um, a bear or bear claws or something like that to help out. But a lot of it, sometimes it's not even beaded. She just cuts the the leather mm -hmm. in the shape and then so and puts that onto the jacket. Throughout the years, Isabel's beadwork has become very well known throughout Saskatchewan. Artist and scholar Sherry Farrell Rosset, who has conducted extensive research on traditional Métis beadwork, speaks of Isabel's work and Cumberland House artistic traditions. I first met Isabel when she was the executive director of the Gabriel Dumont Institute. So I knew her as an administrator and an educator. <clears throat> we were planning a fashion show for one of the Gabriel Dumont Institute cultural conferences in Saskatoon. And I'm not even sure how this happened, but I was just yapping about doing this fashion show and, and Isabel said, oh, well, you know, I have a couple of things. <laughs> very modest, very modest. And so then she comes with these parkas, with the beadwork. And that was when I realized that she was an extraordinary artist, as well as having this career as an educational administrator. <clears throat> I'd been, um, aware of Cumberland House as an artistic community prior to that because um, we had gone up to Cumberland House and stayed with um, Granny Macaulay and I worked with her and she taught me how to make those pointed toe moccasin. So we were aware that this was a very vibrant artistic community. I'm not sure um, to what extent that artistic tradition is being passed on to the younger women. Um, Isabel was one of the younger uh, of the women who continued to produce such excellent, excellent beadwork. I guess there's a couple of things that, um, when I, especially when I read the interview uh, that you had done with Isabel, that again uh, twigged into some of the things that I'd learned previously about the artistic community in Cumberland House. And one was the uh, collaborative nature. She does a lot of experimenting, and there's a real joyfulness and playfulness about the work that she creates. I mean, this is her music, and some are somber and serious, and some are joyful. I mean, the way she puts colors together, um, you know, she's not afraid to experiment and to take risks. She does really extraordinary work. Uh, that was that was the one thing that I that I really hadn't realized the extent to which Isabel continues that tradition. So I, I thought that she's. Um, using the same approach to constructing uh, the design as, uh, as Granny Macaulay did. So I'd be interested to talk to uh, Isabel about that, just to see what, um, what she meant by that. But I assumed that what she meant was that it was the way to remember the design so that it's standardized, that it always comes out pretty much the same. Because there's a lot of, um, you know, particularly in some of the work, it's very symmetrical. She has a lot of control over what she does. When she starts to do something, it comes out the way she wants it to and it was all done by the number of beads. There was a lot of counting involved, so that there was precision. There was precision in the execution of the beadwork. And so you weren't drawing it so much and outlining it. You were starting with that first bead in the center. Uh, most of the people who continue to produce this level of beadwork are people who bead professionally. This is how they make their living. This is something that Isabel does on top of all of the other things that she does. And as far as I know, she is the only professional woman whose artistic output is equal to the output of any uh, Métis artist that I've come across. She makes time for this. This is her art. But when you do beadwork or when you make clothing, it's like the, the minute that parts from your hands, you're forgotten. And so that's why some of the most amazing artists there's, you know, their work is scattered to the winds. They don't have, they never make anything for themselves. So it's like they, they almost never have anything on hand. Um, 
and so much of the work that's out there, there's no documentation. We should be having art shows of, of beadwork like this. So if, you know, if <coughs> Granny Macaulay is one of Isabel's teachers and Ken's mom, Mrs. Carrier, then to have an exhibit of her work, some of the work from her teachers would be something that would be a really significant, because then you're looking at a community, recognition of an artistic community of Cumberland House, and then you're looking also at recognizing this amazing artistic tradition that these women have made. And these are the women who are forgotten when sort of art historians or anthropologists or you know whoever looks at uh, the material in museums, these are the women that get forgotten. So what, what is interesting is that when you look at that, as, and she's identifying that as the, as the sort of traditional Cumberland House style that she remembers, then that really places Cumberland House on that sort of aesthetic map of you know, different communities that, that did that particular style. Isabel often combines 19th century designs with a contemporary color palette. Her designs are very similar to the traditional beadwork designs found in old established Métis communities across the Northwest, stretching from Red River to Fort Coppell to the Mackenzie River Delta. Some of Isabel's designs, although attributed to Cumberland House, can in many ways be seen not only as a local or regional style, but as a common aesthetic representative of an entire population, a population of people interconnected by bonds of kinship, language, culture, and identity. Almost every treatment of uh, traditional work ends sometime in the 19th century. And what is usually presented is this is the peak of the artistic form, it died out, blah, 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 the artists of the past are, you know, the highest level of artistic development, and yet we all know in the community that there is some extraordinary work that's been created and the contemporary artists are neglected. And that's the kind of thing that, that we really need to struggle with is making sure that the artists that are working in traditional media get the same kind of recognition and get treated like artists with the same respect that I get as a painter because it's not fair that as a painter I get a certain kind of respect. Classic design elements of this 19th century style include double line stems with small accents of two or three beads on either side of the stem, swirling tendrils starting between flower petals, small circular berries which are often described as small floating circles, and designs which originate from one complex flower. One element that is also found in 19th century designs, Cumberland House styles, and Isabel's designs are small floral buds. In contemporary work, Isabel layers these buds, one on top of the other, in a style she says is definitive of Cumberland House. Uh, some of the elements that I would um, say that I've seen many times before on the older work in museum collections would be these layered buds. Now that she's done them in a monochromatic color scheme which is unusual when compared to the traditional work, but the basic design is very classic. These three petal flowers, these little twining stems, and these little elements, these little accent elements. People have different names for them. I call them feathered stems. Um, in the Mackenzie River Delta, some researchers have had artists tell them 
that they're called mouse tracks. That, I mean, they're given different terms, but they look the same. And then these little elements here that come off the bud. So that's something that I find very classic about these particular styles. So these uh, double lined stems with the little accents along the side, that's very classic. These little tendrils that come out, that's very classic. These um, berries I, I, yeah, and the little buds and the way the design originates from one large complex flower. So here you have a, a, you know, a larger flower and then you have these sprays coming off. The old styles from Cumberland House tended to be brightly colored floral designs. However, because of limited color availability, designs were often made in red and green hues. In later years, Isabel recalls that you would see a lot of roses and newer styles. Unfortunately, she believes that today Cumberland House has lost a lot of its old styles with the passing of many traditional beaters. One person who still carries on the older styles is Mrs. Agnes Carrier. Mrs. Carrier, who learned to do beadwork from her mother, has chosen to stay with the traditional beadwork designs and hasn't modernized them. Mrs. Carrier and uh, some of the, the work that she does, you don't see anywhere else. There's no particular, I think, rhyme to what you're putting together. What you're doing is you're, you're putting a lot of beadwork with lots of uh, nice colors and you're making sure that what you're decorating is going to be fully decorated and it's going to be vivid and it's going to complement the person who's going to wear that piece of, uh, that garment or that clothing. And uh, Mrs. Uh, Carrier, of course, with her very strong uh, traditional designs that she has and uh, I hope that she's given that to other people and, and you know, carry on her, her good work that uh, she, she's, she's uh, got and, uh, you know, she's getting up there now, she's getting older. If you were to go into the community of Cumberland and uh, ask uh, how many people still bead, it gives uh, me a nice feeling to know that many of them are still beading because I know of uh, some communities where the entire community has lost, you know, that uh, skill of beating. And I think it's just a sign of uh, the times. You know, people are busy and uh, uh, this is not something that they have a whole lot of time to do. And I hope it doesn't get lost because it's fun. I, uh, beating is a relaxation for me. Design symmetry is very important to Métis beadwork designs, and like other beadworkers, Isabel uses various techniques when she beads. So it almost looks like when you first glance, you think, oh, well, these flowers are all exactly the same. But when you, when you look at it more closely, you think, oh, no, actually there, there are differences. There are really subtle differences. And yet the piece is perfectly balanced. So this is something also that you see in the traditional work, uh, what some people call the classic work. Uh, that comes out of the 19th century and that uh, complex designs will initially look like they're mere symmetrical like the artist has repeated on one side what's on the other side but in actual fact the artist has complete you know completed the work it appears to be perfectly balanced so it looks like it's a mirror image but when you look really closely it isn't it isn't at all so she's a very masterful beadworker and she combines these traditional elements with some of her um, more modern influences. Isabel's favorite designs are the Métis style floral beadwork and she enjoys beading the northern flowers. She prefers a lot of colors and bright colored beads on a very dark background, which is common preference among many northern Métis women. Isabel prefers to bead on naturally tanned hides, but because of availability, she is often forced to use commercial leather. Isabel also does a lot of beadwork on heavier fabrics, such as velvet, and creates designs full of color. Her palette is very contemporary. So it's, she's putting colors together um, in a very 21st century way. So she's really playing with color. She's being really bold, really brave with color, putting some unusual combinations together. Oh, 
I love all colors. I go to a store where they have beads and I just imagine all kinds of flowers when I'm in there and I pick up everything that I, colors that I don't have and uh, I must have about 200 different colors. <laughs> so I've got beads from all over in North America. <laughs> And if I find more, I'll probably buy more. I just love beads. <laughs> Isabel considers herself very fortunate to have been raised in Cumberland House and taught how to bead by such extraordinary women. She believes that recognition should be given to each of these elders who were her teachers, mentors, and friends. A lot of the women that have passed on who, uh, who are still here with us in spirit as we, we do these things because they, they were our teachers and... Uh, Many of the women, of course, uh, didn't write this information down simply because they probably couldn't. Uh, and also following tradition, it, you know, you, you give this, these gifts and to the younger generation by teaching them how to do it and being part of their life. <laughs> Sagen, sei mal wie du zimmen. Geh, sei mal wie du zimmen. Geh, sei mal wie du zimmen. Da nur mal Bilder posten, du sagst doch, geh doch da. 